From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. This season of Big Ideas focuses on sustainability and sustainable practices. On this episode, I'm exploring the work of Ali Hogue, a spring 2022 ICS faculty fellow who's reimagining how we use light to be more attuned with the environment and our own bodies. Allie is a full-time instructor of glasswork and the glass area head at BGSU. Allie has exhibited her artwork around the world, including Bergen, Norway, and Paris. Her current research and design project is centered around new ways to utilize glass as an architectural material to transform constructed spaces. Thanks for joining me today, Allie. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Julie. You've spent your entire career working with glass in various ways, whether that be through art, performance, or constructing built environments. Could you take us back a little bit to how you first got interested in glass work? Sure. I was a freshman at uh, Tulane University going uh, pre-med, and I've always just really enjoyed art and making um, growing up. And I just as a, as a fluke, I, I took a uh, glass course my freshman year for semester because it sounded fun. And really different. So I took the class and I was addicted and slowly realized that it was something that I really like had my passion. So I, I decided to pursue it. I eventually left Tulane and went to University of Hawaii where my father has lived for, you know, 20 years. So I got in-state tuition in Hawaii and got a really um, delve into getting a BFA in glass there. And um Stayed there probably for seven years after my after I graduated and I was a TA there too. So I got to keep my hand in the studio and uh, keep making. So that's that's kind of how my little U turn into glass happened. <laughs> well, it's interesting because your work really is, and we'll talk more about this. Really, is a marriage of art and science, um, and bringing together kind of the creative with deeply like with the chemistry of glass and with um, the physics of light and all of that. Could you talk a little bit of how you got interested in the application of glass for architecture in particular for this project? Well, you know, I think that art making kind of takes you on like a winding road and you end up having all of these different jobs and opportunities along the way. So after undergraduate at uh, University of Hawaii, I worked with my family and they had a general contracting business. So I, in another life for a short amount of time, I, I, I was on in the field, like assisting as a superintendent, just like managing and doing a little bit of project ma- management and estimating. I also got my, um, a uh, lead certification uh, for environmental design, um, you know, working towards like a goal of like doing general contracting with uh, environmental design at, at heart of it. Um, that happened uh, before 2008. And then 2008 happened and in Florida and across the country, you know, construction went to a halt. And I still had in my heart of hearts like wanting to pursue glass. So I went and got my master's and and continued in the field of art and education. So I had this background of like knowing the vocabulary of construction and building and that like kind of like parallel interest that was like kind of like latent in the background. And as I continued uh, working at Bowling Green State University and becoming involved in like art programming up in Toledo, Um, In the rich glass history there, um, I became um, part of the steering committee creating the Momentum Arts Industry Intersection Project. And uh, the first iteration of that project, Katie Newell, 
was uh, one of the finalists who was given a Pilkington NSG um, float glass towards making a project that was then exhibited um, publicly in Toledo during the Momentum Arts Festival. So um, I really got to enter into a conversation with Katie then. I really, really just loved her work, her interest in glass in, in uh, concert with um, creating uh, architecture and spatial designs. And um, we just really got along. So after that project, I helped Katie out with one of one of her other projects, making some glass components for a tilt wall concrete um, construction. So um, we got to spend some time making some glass in the studio, had some fun, and we entered into just another conversation. And we decided to move forward with um, kind of pursuing it in the form of a collaboration. And my little background knowledge you know, in collaborating, you have to, you know, it really helps to not only have a deep area of knowledge in which you're focusing, but to also have the vocabulary to understand the breadth and depth of someone else's deep area of knowledge. So Katie could tell me things and I know just enough to like, you know, pick up on what she's throwing down and be able to like move in this, in a, you know, in a good direction with her in terms of uh, collaborating and research. So with this project, you're creating custom design glass blocks in order to transform the way that light is delivered into interior spaces. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about the project and kind of what some of that process has been and where it is in development right now? So Katie and I are are starting this uh, project and we've been working on this project since 2019. We got a little slowed down during the pandemic, but uh, we've... uh, um, we've regrouped and we're moving at full steam ahead. Um, we're looking at the glass as not only having its uh, optical properties that you know it's known for in architecture, such as uh, windows and uh, kind of like the ubiquitous glass block that's been around really since the 1930s. But we want to um, take that one step further and really unpack the structural um, capabilities of glass as well. Glass is incredibly strong in compression. And there's also like new adhesives and and modes of building that add to that kind of structural integrity. But one thing that we want to do is really as a like kind of core um, idea behind like designing a modular glass block system is we want to have the natural articulations of light um, going from day to night um, actually articulated within our spaces. Um, Instead of um, historically like uh, glass block designs was uh, basically to bring as much light in and then diffuse it within a space. Our glass block, we really want to articulate the shifts in day and night um, within the built environment in order to reset the circadian rhythms of, of the inhabitants within the built environment. And for folks, I wish, you know, we could see what these look like, but they're kind of a an octahedron shape, exactly. a kind of a faceted block. This is not your old fashioned, <laughs> you know, rectilinear glass block. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the, in addition to, you've talked about the architectural elements, but they also have quite a, a potential for aesthetics as well. Could you talk about some of those experiments you and Katie have been looking into? Certainly. Thanks. Um, So it is an octahedral shape. And uh, we were like originally kind of inspired by different like crystal formations and like just as like a maker and a designer, it's really wonderful thinking about a shape that has a lot of different um, aggregation potentials that tessellates in in quite a number of ways. So um, thinking about um, designing something with a lot of different aggregations, not only does it have like a aesthetic value. It also um, has a thinner orientation or a thicker orientation. So as we change that tessellation and orientation within like a wall, a built wall, um, we could also articulate the light and and bring in more privacy or transparency into the space. So hopefully we we are able to have like this hand in hand um, aesthetics plus function and articulation of light happening. In addition, um, we're we make these components of the octahedron as uh, two halves being um, joined in the middle. 
um, with adhesive. So thinking about when we slow down this process to like the actual time it takes to make something, you think about these opportunities in construction. So within the individual block, we have one glue joint we have to deal with right at the center of the octahedron. So um, one thing that we have begun really looking into, um, which is also this marriage of um, aesthetics and um, function in terms of articulation of light, is uh, dyeing the glue joint. So from straight ahead, in most orientations, you're going to not see any color. But as an inhabitant uh, moves across the space, uh, they'll see a flash of like this color coming in and out of view. And if a building is theoretically designed with a, let's say, like nighttime artificial light source, we could build and design a structure where those glue joints are kind of lined up to shade that artificial light from coming into a space at night. One focus of the project, clearly, is the ability to alter the way we construct and inhabit our manufactured environments by the relationship between the outside and the inside world. How do you kind of think about that relationship between internal and external space and the role design can play in that relationship? Sure. I feel, you know, historically, um, we've been looking at our precedents and, and really from like early on, like the use of glass in the window has been just being like without um, electrification, Um, historically been a source of just like this light hungry kind of attitude, right? And um, even with, you know, the development of um, widespread use of electricity, windows were also used to just maximize light and just maximize um, the ability to work in a lot of ways. Um, especially in industrial situations. So we're really thinking about live spaces and um, the human being as a part of the environment. And uh, we really want to design in a way where we reconnect to those patterns instead of having like a wall actually be like a separation line, right? So I think that there's this uh, really overt design value to to really kind of rethink the idea of like the wall as a separation line instead of a a way to um, permeable a permeable kind of membrane to like let the outside in and then also be able to have like the inhabitant be able to reconnect with the environment even though they are inside. Mm. It's so interesting because we've spent so much time I think over the last decade sort of talking about you know, the problem, people are not getting enough rest. And it's sort of the solutions tend to be focused on the individual, right? Improve your sleep hygiene, turn off your screens, things like that. So how do you think about this as sort of fundamentally altering where responsibility lies, not to kind of the individual to turn those things off, but to sort of rethink the use of space itself? Yeah, I feel like we all feel the pressure to always be checking our email. You know, it it becomes like a practice to kind of like turn those things off and and uh, know your own responsibility within like the, <laughs> the reset of circadian rhythms for sure. But I feel like everything that we could do and even like just like the culture of living in a building that really articulated daylight and dark and true darkness, like let's not forget like true darkness and the importance of that as well. I feel like that would in- inherently kind of give the inhabitant like like cues as well to turn off instead of um, have it be, you know, you're in this like kind of like closed off room with apertures and making all these decisions. You know, um, the environment within the built space itself could also give you those cues in a more kind of like naturally informed way. So you've been creating these glass blocks. You're sort of finalizing the design. Once you kind of have settled on that and begin manufacturing, you have intentions to use these blocks to build a structure. Can you tell us more about that structure, where you'll build it, and its potential functions? So we are currently in the phase of, as a glass worker, we're really doing a lot of the R&D in-house at the Bowling Green State University uh, Glass Studio. So we have used a lot of... um, digital modeling programming to model out different structures and the way things tessellate. So we currently have uh, milled out a graphite mold um, where we're making small aggregations. And uh, then we are also getting a special UV glue made by DLO um, in Germany to create these small aggregations. And we've now just like this week begun initial partnership with a structural engineer So um, we're going to be making small aggregations. They're going to be kind of like testing our our designs digitally to um, just like 
see what kind of points we really need to start doing um, structural integrity testing at and what what uh, different aggregations have the most potential and like basically how high we could go, how big we could kind of go within the structure's in inherent abilities. So after that, we're going to take these uh, physical aggregations and we're going to physically crush them to like see what they're really like out of theoretical aggregation and computation into like real life. So we're going to be working um, over the summer doing that. And then after we do all of our testing, we're hoping to go up to the University of Michigan Biological Center in Pelston, Michigan, which is also a night sky zone. I was lucky enough to um, be there, I think, like two weeks ago with Katie and, and her prototyping class. And it's just truly breathtaking. And, you know, there's just an incredible sense of daylight and darkness and all the seasons there. So we were going and looking at site visits by uh, a really big, beautiful lake there. So we have a couple we have a couple sites and we're expecting to build like a small structure um, there as soon as we do all of our mold verification, all of our structural testing and, and get uh, our designs together. Wonderful. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas podcast. If you are passionate about big ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with ICS faculty fellow and artist, Ali Hoag. As you've mentioned, this project is in collaboration with Katie Newell, an associate professor of architecture at the University of Michigan. How has that process of bringing together your different disciplinary trainings and skill sets shaped the project? In some ways, how is it different than it might have been if you had tackled this solo? <laughs> I don't think it would have been possible tackling it solo. Um, it's really uh, it's quite remarkable to be able to work on it, you know, in a collaborative way with Katie. Um, Katie has a special um real uh, research focus in the articulation of light within her architectural spaces and uh, especially um, glass too. So she is very, very committed to the material of glass and my like low level uh, understanding of construction methods has helped me. Like Katie has a knowledge of glass working too. So Katie's in the glass studio with me like while we're casting these out. I'm getting uh, my feet wet with like the digital modeling and, and uh, you know, so we're able to really go places with our expertise that, you know, just with one another's like really complementary expertise, we're able to like, I think like work in a way that kind of like brings up a lot of possibilities in a way that like wouldn't have come up when if we were, you know, trying to pursue this um, alone, let's say. Um, but also uh, just being able to understand and kind of uh, see this this project from a number of different perspectives um, simultaneously and kind of like enter into a conversation of like, like what kind of questions does this make? Like what kind of potential is here? And um, we both really value the the process of making within um, discovery and research. So really slowing that down. We meet once a week. We're in the lab together. So um, like spending that time together like really opens up the possibilities and you know when something doesn't work there's also something that's discovered and I think that you know the nitty-gritty of that kind of um collaborative process is like where you know it's like that's where the deliciousness is. What has this project taught you about the opportunities as well as challenges of cross-institutional collaboration? It actually has been really kind of supportive right now you know um Katie and I were, were both awarded um, a BGSU uh, GLANS Award for collaborative research, um, which is uh, specifically for either faculty at BG uh, working across different areas or faculty from different institutions that, are, that have overlap in their research. So there was actually like funding and support for that uh, right here at BGSU. And uh, there's something really interesting, too, about the fact that University of Michigan doesn't have a glass program and um, University of Michigan does have like this amazing like digital and material um, facility there. Just all the opportunities to use uh, digital technology in the making process. So I believe that our facilities really complement one another, especially for this project. And there's just been a lot of like really great support. 
You've also collaborated with industrial partners as part of this project. Tell us about some of those relationships and how they have affected or you hope will have shaped the project in the future as you move into the manufacturing stage eventually. Sure, sure. So like I mentioned before, we are working in the studio right now producing our own blocks and really doing a lot of the R&D and structural um, kind of uh, understanding of these components. But ideally, we wouldn't be making hundreds of thousands of them by hand. So there's something really special about teaching glass here in Bowling Green, being so close um, to the the glass industry and uh, art, glass art community in Toledo. So I've been working uh, through the Arts Commission and have been able to meet quite a few folks that um, are from glass industry up in Toledo that are also interested in promoting the arts as well. So um, I've been able to just be in conversation with a lot of these industry experts and um, think about different possibilities. So one of them that I've worked most closely with is at NSG Pilkington. Kyle Sword is just uh, an incredible resource and also works with me on the Momentum Intersection um, Arts Industry Project, where the artists are given the NSG Pilkington glass and technical support. So we just enter into conversation quite a bit since we work together in that way. And uh, some of the things that we ask are like, oh, it's like, what what do you have? You know, like what's in, you know, like what things aren't being used at NSG Pilkington? And, you know, or Kyle will be like, hey, could you use this? We have a pile of this, you know. So there's been like little offshoot co-research avenues that have kind of developed because of that. You know, Katie and I are looking at making these glass blocks, um, and they have a Pilkington NSG pile of Opti White, like a tiny bit off, off clear cullet, which is a uh, cullet is like broken up pieces of glass that are used to remelt and be used again. But this glass is a, just a teeny bit off from its like super premium, super clear glass, and it isn't quite cost effective to use it in their regular float glass um, to be remelted. So I entered into a conversation with Kyle and some of his glass chemists, and, and we um, started coming up with some basic formulas where it would mat- if we could add some additive, it would be close to the studio glass that we work with. Um, we did a couple test melts over at Alfred University to kind of see the potential in that, and we're in conversation. So even this summer, when Katie and I are working on um, casting these pieces, we might go and grab some of that cullet and then melt a little bit to see if uh, unaltered for a casting glass, it could be just perfectly fine. So we have um, some kind of like recycling opportunities that I don't think would happen anywhere else. Um, we've also entered into conversation just understanding what it would take to translate these these um, glass pieces into um, industrial produced pieces. So to make a small little structure, we need Five to ten thousand, right? Um, that seems like a whole bunch, but the minimum order for um, any kind of industry, whether it's like a bottle or a press glass through Libby, it's going to be about a hundred thousand, and also the, the cost of the molds in addition to the per piece. So um, that's a big um, investment, and you need to know exactly what what your block's capable of beforehand. So it, it, it kind of allows me to see what we need to shoot for in terms of um, making an industrial mold, but it also shows the value of being nimble in a glass studio here among all the glass industry to kind of do the R&D uh, before it goes up to that kind of level of machinery. You've alluded to kind of glasses qualities of being able to recycle some of this. Can you talk a bit about the efforts you have in mind for ensuring glass block production is done sustainably? Yeah. Well, um, like I mentioned before, we might be um, trying to use this cullet to melt over the summer. So it will be like a byproduct. And at the end of the day, um, our the glass structure that we're, we're building, it will be entirely recyclable. It's not going to be using a concrete mortar. It's going to be using a UV glue that would would be able to be burned off. You know, if, if the building is dismantled, it can be like remelted again. So we're trying our best. We res- <laughs> You know, it's uh, also trying to think about like systems. Like once we have something in production, you could really think about how to make the system as clean as possible. How are you ultimately hoping your design and its implementation might alter the way we engage with our constructed environments? Well, I I really think that if you look at a building material and start constructing and thinking about designing a building material that has all these opportunities to articulate light, 
someone will actually be able to be hopefully inspired by all of these possibilities if they're especially unpacked and then be able to design with them in this way where they could have the um, ability to design while unpacking everything that's possible in light articulation within this, this building material. So um, the building material is inherently uh, sensitive to light, right? And sensitive to creating darkness inside depending on how you design with it. So hopefully that will enter into um, an architect's or a designer's mind as a great opportunity and um, opportunity to um, think differently and uh, think more openly about um, light articulation within spaces. What advice do you have or for, I'm thinking, young people, maybe students who are sort of thinking or really interested in environmental sustainability and kind of more humane ways of living and working? How would you encourage them to kind of move forward to sort of rethink the known world, right? And to dream big about other possibilities and about kind of the creative process to get outside of, you know, repeating the way things have always been done. Yeah. Well, I really think that for me, like an arts education was really helpful just in terms of like thinking about like, well, what's possible, you know? And then also my relationship to failure is something that is I don't know, a source of inspiration. And I think that like within constraints, there's creativity like latently there. So um, it's basically like, you know, think about when you hit a roadblock or something, like what else is possible? And also when something doesn't work right, thinking about like what possibilities are there, you know, and like what discoveries are to be made in the process. And you know, I feel like just being open and curious about other opportunities and saying, like, what if, and then being able to, like, back it up with, like, some sheer determination and grit to, like, <laughs> see it through. Like, that's a recipe for kind of, like, just changing your outlook and changing the world that you reside in. Because, you know, you have, I don't know, I feel everyone has, like, so much power when they just, like, put their drive and their curiosity into action. Thanks so much for joining me today, Allie. Listeners can keep up with ICS happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to suggest a topic for a future episode, visit bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Our producers are Chris Cavera and Marco Mendoza with sound engineering by Deanna McKeegan and Marco Mendoza. Research assistance was provided by Branson Young with editing by Carrie Hanlon.